Uh, first of all, I, I really do want to uh, sincerely thank the uh, foundation, uh, Jennifer, especially Harold, um, uh, for their uh, really impressive um, leadership on this topic. Uh, we first started playing around with what we called excellence gaps probably about eight or nine years ago. Um, and we always knew it was probably going to be a slow burn, but we didn't expect people to completely ignore us for five or six years. And so you know, slowly over time, people have paid attention, and now it's not rare for me to go to various states and have policymakers say, oh, excellence gaps, I've heard about that. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, and, that, and especially now, um, uh, there are somewhat founded rumors that the new ESCA bill may have excellence gap language in it. Um, uh, so I, all this work is really kind of culminating, and I've heard many people say this uh, yesterday, uh, last night, this morning, that it does feel like we are actually chipping away at this issue, and that we, we are on the verge of actually creating some really positive long-term change. Um, and we couldn't do that without the support of the uh, foundation, so uh, thank you. Um, you know, at, at the same time, uh, this morning, as I was listening to everybody, and last night, it's such an emotional topic and it's something that you're all dealing with every single day. And then uh, you kind of finish this two-day experience by listening to the data guy. And my question is, what did you ever do to Harold that he makes you have to sit through with a data guy at the end of this thing? But, um, uh, and uh, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but um, as I was lurking around this morning in the shadows, uh, I literally heard three different people say, I, I, I really hope this guy's not boring. Um, that's a direct quote from one person, and I just sat there going, he has no idea I'm two feet away from him. And um, uh, I have been described with many different adjectives. Um, uh, quirky if they're being kind, uh, a little too intense, that, that was my uh, teenage daughter. Um, uh, my favorite was probably um, the grumpiness of a much older man, which I kind of took as a compliment, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, but boring's never been one of them, so uh, we'll, we'll see if I can convince you of that today. Um, so, uh, I'm going to set the table a little bit, a little quick quiz to get started. Uh, talk about uh, what does American academic excellence look like? We have incredible data now on this. We know exactly where we stand, state by state, country by country. Um, and then uh, I, I, uh, I am going to give you uh, pretty much a 10,000 foot overview of what of what we're trying to do in this study. Um, and then just some uh, random, hopefully uh, pithy observations at the end to kind of lead us into the next session where we really talk about solutions. Um, so setting the table of the 21st century. Uh, some of you have heard me do this before, so pretend you don't know the answers. There are three mega countries, populations much bigger than any other country. What's the first one? Second one? Third one? <laughs> that is exactly what I heard. <laughs> States, someone said at the end. Correct. Um, people, forget, people forget that we are one of the mega countries. Our population, 350 to 370 million, depend on who's counting um, and why they're counting. But um, uh, that is literally like 80 to 100 million in the fourth place country. Um, and it tails off rapidly after that. Uh, but when I talk to most Americans, we don't realize that we are the third biggest country in the world. We act like, oh yeah, we'll just go out and solve this problem. Poverty, done. Well, you know, in Finland, it's a lot easier because Finland is a lot smaller and a much smaller population. Um, and even they haven't figured it out. So a lot of our problems are really our problems of scale in this country. This is a gigantic, both in terms of area and population country, and it's very diverse in pretty much any way you can define diversity. Uh, that has to be part of this conversation. This is one of my favorites. What percentage of the world's interne internet traffic crosses international border? We live in a global world, right? I heard 40, I heard 25. 11, 5. You're, you're just randomly throwing out numbers at this point. Um, it's actually 15, which is a lot less than most people think. Uh, most surveys people estimate it's anywhere between 40 and 80 percent. 
uh, the vast majority of internet traffic stays within our own borders. Uh, is that number increasing? Absolutely. Uh, and so just some random observations about the world, that, the world that, that we're dealing with. Everyone talks about globalization like it's here. We have started globalization. We have a lot more to go. I think the U.S. right now is, ne uh, is negotiating like 15 different free trade pacts with different countries. Uh, there's a lot of globalization that we have not yet even begun to experience. The world will look radically different for that reason alone in five years, let alone 10, 15, 20, 50. Um, I w technology increases massively, right? I mean, uh, seven years ago, we didn't have these. We've only had smartphones since 2007. So the only smartphone designers were people locked in Steve Jobs' basement, pretty much, <laughs> in 2007. That's a small joke only. Um, it, uh, now there are hundreds of thousands of people who work on technology dealing with, sport, with, with, with smartphones. That's a job category that did not exist seven or eight years ago. Now it's a huge employer and driver of knowledge, everything. My uh, son, uh, whenever we go out to dinner, we try to do that several times a week, and, or at least eating dinner together at home, and uh, if someone asks a question, invariably everyone pulls out their phone to look up the answer, and he had a great line about two years ago, he was like, don't you people know anything that your phone can't answer for you? And, um, <laughs> which made us all go, that's, that's a really, really, really good question. <laughs> Um, so uh, a lot more technology, it can be positive and negative, and we see this in schools every single day, right? Especially high schools. Technology can be such a learning boost, and it can be such a major distraction and corrupter in many, many ways. We're going back to a world with it's more bipolar. Um, uh, most of U.S. history, we've always had a counterbalance. We haven't really for the last generation. Uh, Russia would like to think it's them again. It's probably China moving forward, right? Uh, that's going to that's gonna change everything. Policies, education, just like the last Cold War did. Uh, a lot of these developing countries are not really developing anymore. They have developed. Uh, South Korea is considered a developing country. Walk around Seoul and tell me that you're not in a thoroughly modern, developed, world-class city. I can say that about lots of cities in China, too. Taiwan. A lot of these developing countries uh, have largely economically developed. That's changing how jobs work. That's changing the role of education everywhere. And we're getting more economic equality among countries, but more inequality within countries, mostly because we're using market-based reforms to lift people out of poverty. It seems to be working, but that always spreads equality, financial equality out considerably. We're certainly talking about that a lot in this country right now. And then immigration and um, migration patterns are really, really changing. Uh, I, think the, I think the estimate is uh, between 500 and 750 million people in China have moved from rural areas to urban areas in the past 25 years. So essentially twice as many people are in the third biggest country in the world have moved. That has radically changed that country. And it's starting to radically change our economy. Um, so all these things are happening. The only thing that we can really predict um, is that the need for different jobs are changing. Uh, this is a classic, this is about seven or eight years old now, sort of a classic depiction by a couple of um, uh, Harvard education and economics uh, scholars uh, on the types of skills that our students are going to need in jobs moving forward. And this is not a huge surprise to anybody, right? Routine, cognitive, and manual jobs, the demand is going down in this country. Uh, complex thinking, being able to think on your feet, solve problems, not only being an expert in something, but being able to solve problems with that expertise are becoming critically important. And this is an estimate for all of the world's major developed economies. We're all moving in this direction rapidly. Um, so, I mean, what does the future look like? Anyone who tells you that they know is wrong, right? We're supposed to be uh, flying Jetsons cars right now, according to how I was brought up. That has not come to pass, oddly enough. Um, so we don't know, but we do know uh, that, the, that the 21st century is going to be very different. And 
And because things are moving so fast, we don't know what tomorrow's jobs are going to look like. We don't know what our communities will eventually become. And yet we have to prepare students for those communities. It makes it extremely challenging. The one thing we know for certain, we cannot argue with, is that we need talented people to do that. We need talented people to do that. Um, if they're already talented, great. That's how the United States has, gen has generally done it before, right? We've attracted the world's best and brightest here. For reasons that I talk about, those trends are changing. We need to help more of our students who have tons of potential, the students we've been talking about for the past 24 hours. We need to help them um, develop and use and employ their talents for their own benefit, their family's benefit, and our benefit. Critically important. So, what does excellence in the US and other countries look like? I'm gonna use um, data from, the, uh, from IEA, um, which is one of the two major international assessment groups. You've heard of the PISA scores? Uh, PISA is a study of the world's 15-year-olds. We like um, Tim's and Pearl's, which are the IEA tests better, because they, taste, they, they test at a grade level. So if you tell me how well an American 15-year-old does on those tests, I'm not really sure which grade I'm looking at, right? Because a 15-year-old can be in three different grades, conceivably. Um, but if you tell me uh, on the Tim's test that we tested fourth and eighth graders, now I know exactly what the context is. So th those are the data that I'm going to share with you. And I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly because um, I want to get to the uh, report here. So uh, on the left is grade four math. On the right is grade eight math. Uh, and the only thing you need to know is that uh, the US is not the country on the top. This is the percent of students who score advanced. Uh, so grade four and grade eight math. This is science, a little better in grade four. And most international tests tell us that, that our best and brightest score with the world's best and brightest at grade four science. That's the only test and the only grade level, interestingly enough. That said, um, I was talking to one of my children once, and uh, you know, we talk a lot about reading and math, and I said, hey, what, what are you guys doing in science? And this is no exaggeration. I got the the driest look, and she said, science. We don't do science. And I checked in, science has become an elective in this country in many, many ways, as has social studies. Forget art, physical education, and things like that, right? Um, and you've got these specialized schools that are doing such great jobs, but as everyone talked about yesterday, right, it's the feeder problem that we have. If they're not getting science, art, social studies, in any comprehensive way, is it surprising that our scores dip so much? Not really. Uh, this is grade four reading, uh, and most international tests say this too. At grade four reading, we do, we do very well. Our best students perform at world-class levels, and it drops like this almost immediately afterwards. So if you're already talented, it's great. The American system works pretty well for you. If you need help developing that talent, the students that we've been talking about here who need help, who need that advocate, uh, you generally are not going to perform well. Uh, in fact, if I had to predict, based on data that I'm gonna show you in one minute, if you had a talented inner city student, um, uh, a non-traditional family, low income, uh, racial minority, the data tell us that if they're, that if they're performing at a talented level, second, third, fourth grade, I can predict with almost certainty that they will not be performing at that level within three years. That's how bad the data are. Um, so we've got to tackle this problem. Um, so this is on our national NAEP test. These are the percent of students who score advanced by state. So this is grade four math. Traditional stoplight color, green, very good, Massachusetts and Maryland. Yellow, eh. Uh, red, very low percentages, less than 5% scoring advanced. So that's grade four math, grade eight math. That's actually better. It's a lot less red and a lot more yellow and a little more green when I go back and forth. This is grade four reading. Again, we're doing pretty well with getting our best students reading at very advanced comprehension levels. And that's grade eight reading. Um, just to really beat that horse to death, because I like your reaction every time you do that. <laughs> grade four reading, grade eight reading. Four. <laughs> uh, uh, 
It was actually better the second time. I appreciate that. You're just humoring me now. But um, uh, uh, my team doesn't like me to show that one because it's just so depressing. Um, and actually, when we did the uh, report these past few months, we had to account for the fact that so few eighth graders in this country actually can read and comprehend at advanced levels. Um, I think the overall average is five or six percent, which is uh, shockingly low. Um, just to go back one, uh, I did have an off-the-record conversation once with someone who helped design these international assessments, and I said, honestly, for a country like the United States, huge population, very diverse, you know, lots of poverty, um, what's really the best percentage of advanced students that we could see on these? And he said, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And he said, well, just tell me. He said, okay, but you can't ever tell, tell anyone this. So <laughs> just between us friends. Um, he said, uh, the test was designed so that at least 40% of Americans could conceivably score advanced on these tests. Four, zero percent. And I said, but we're kind of at five on some of these. And he goes, we know, we've never understood why we do so poorly. And I think we're gonna show you some data that actually explains why. So um, again, just for uh, fun, okay, uh, horrible. So where does our talent come from? So this is the number of students, um, the number of international students that come to each country for um, college. This is traditionally where a lot of our talent has come from. Uh, we attract the world's best and brightest to our higher education system, and then we keep them here. We're not keeping them here as much. Uh, and then uh, I, I, I just heard this in uh, Baltimore in uh, November. Um, at, at a lot of defense contractors especially, uh, they, ha they cannot fill their tech jobs fast enough, right? They cannot fill them fast enough. Even during the depths of the downturn, there were two and a half million open positions that companies could not fill, and they were mostly tech jobs. You cannot fill these tech jobs. Here's a huge problem, though. For many of these tech jobs now, you need a security clearance, so you have to be a U.S. citizen. We literally have to find ways to fill our own technology needs moving forward, in part because that bar gets a little smaller every year. Again, because those developing countries have become developed and their universities are getting better. So people can stay home and spend much less money to get a world-class education. We're already starting to see that in China. Okay, uh, let me talk about excellence gaps briefly. Um, this was our uh, last report. Um, and I'll make sure that all the slides are posted in the end so you, you can download all of these. Um, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of these. There are dozens of these different graphs. So this is the percentage of students in the US for the whole country who score advanced on the NAEP grade four math test by free or uh, reduced lunch status. Um, so you'll see, uh, prior to No Child Left Behind, uh, very few of any students scored advanced. Uh, in the No Child Left Behind era, that has gotten much, much better. But we've seen this huge gap develop where it's really spread out on us. And so um, I did have a colleague once say, well, technically, you know, the increase from 3.1 to 11.4 as a percentage is smaller than the increase from 0 0.3 to 1.8. That feels like splitting statistical hairs like only academics can do. So my joke to her, and she didn't talk to me for a few weeks after that, was you're totally right. To go from 0 0.3 to 1.8, we've gone from apocalyptically bad to embarrassingly horrible. That's American progress. And now that I actually say it out loud, she probably shouldn't have talked to me for longer than that, because that was really offensive. But anyway, um, this is grade eight. It looks pretty much the same. Um, uh, it, it, at this meeting, we're talking primarily about low-income students, but I wanted to show you that by race, it looks very, very similar. So um, Asian American, uh, Caucasian, Hispanic, black students. Uh, Native American students uh, pretty much split the difference on the black and Hispanic students there. Um, uh, but again, I think it's really interesting that in 1996, uh, so few students were actually scoring advanced in general in every group, in every group. And that has increased substantially for some groups, but the success has not been felt by the students that we are trying to help the most. It's just not happening. Um, uh, grade four reading looks fairly similar, although we haven't seen um, a 
as big gains in reading, in terms of getting more students to score at those excellent levels. So uh, people always say, well, how come you're not looking at creativity? If there was a state-by-state -state comparison for creativity, I would use that first and foremost. It's not out there. Um, uh, I go to all these meetings where they talk about, we need to come up with better, different assessments. Uh, if that were easy, everyone would be doing it, and we, we all know that, right? Um, and that's so difficult to do. I'd love an applied problem-solving measure in every content area. Not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, the reason why we don't show you other test results is because math and reading are the best ones. So this is science, the last time they did science. So full price lunch students, about three and a half percent. That actually is a zero for reduced free price students. Uh, white students, about three and a half percent. Black students, zero. Hispanic students, just shy of one percent. Um, that's on our national uh, grade eight science test. So we have these pockets of excellence, which quite frankly are your schools. And outside of that, we're just not producing lots of talent. We're all this talent, we are literally leaving it on the sidelines. How do we close these gaps and help these students? Uh, let me just, I just want to talk very briefly about, about poverty since we're talking about it a lot and show you two of my favorite graphs. The quality on these are not great because I stole them from somewhere else and can't find the original. So. Um, with, with that caveat in mind, uh, uh, the one on the left, the uh, red one, I think is the most important. That's um, poverty rate by county, uh, which is not perfect. So I live in Hartford County, Connecticut, which is shown as having a less than 12% poverty rate. Uh, in fact, all of Connecticut is shown that way on that red map. And yet we have three of the five poorest cities in the country in Connecticut, including in my own county. Um, so when you do it by county and not by local government unit, you, it, it all averages out a little bit. Um, so if you did it by municipality, almost the entire map would look solid red. And that's one of the things that I think um, that when I speak to groups, they tend to forget is just the idea that um, poverty is everywhere. We don't see it because it's so unpleasant for us so we, we work really hard not to look for it. So as you leave today, not to have you leave on a bummer, but uh, as you're driving out, going to the airport, just look for poverty, and you, you will actually see signs to it. We, we, we try to desensitize ourselves because it's so prevalent and it's everywhere. Uh, the data that came out, was it last week, uh, that now 51% of our uh, K-12 uh, student population uh, qualifies for free or uh, reduced price lunch. That's a family income, I believe, 1.85 times the uh, federal poverty level, 51%. Uh, uh, that's interesting, but I think it's more interesting that roughly half of our states have been over 51% for years. Um, so uh, poverty really is everywhere. So, uh, And this one is interesting. So this is the childhood poverty rate in different industrialized countries. Why do I include Romania? because you never make America last in anything when you talk to American audiences. Um, that was a little bit funnier than you actually, uh, you sure were. <laughs> that, that's what I was looking for. But this is, this is why I think this is really important for us today. The blue bars are what it would, I guess that looks green to you, um, are what the child poverty rates would be if there were no government programs. And you notice one thing about the United States, Italy, Japan, compared to others, is it wouldn't change that much because we've rolled back most of our childhood poverty programs since about 1980. Um, draw what conclusions you will, but that's the facts. Um, government is not gonna help us shrink these gaps uh, as far as the national government goes. Uh, state government is a, whole different, is a whole different topic and that's what we're going to talk about. So the purpose of the study that we started, um, it feels like 100 years ago, but it was three months ago, <laughs> maybe, um, was, uh, you know, wouldn't it be good to look at state level policy? Um, I, I was just in China uh, about 10 days ago or so, and uh, I got a question from this group of people who do educational assessment there, and they essentially wanted me to explain the American educational system to them in like five minutes. 
And uh, I realized after half an hour, I was trying to explain federalism to them. And I was making the case, federalism is awesome. And they literally were looking at me like, how can you be the greatest country in the world? It's such a confusing system. It really is. Uh, but, and I think we're starting to see this, um, is uh, states really do hold most of the education policy making power in this country. That has been less true the past 15 years. Uh, it certainly looks like it's going to be more true again, if you will. Um, so I, state policy, I think, is really where these battles can be fought and won effectively to help these students. So really the purpose of this is to help state policymakers um, really see the degree to which the policies that they put in place help or discourage the development of talent in these low-income students. I don't think any policymaker anywhere deliberately goes to their state house and thinks, how can I accidentally um, uh, uh, create policies that really hurt low-income talented kids? None of them do that. I think they just don't think about low-income talented kids. So when they put in, for example, rigid kindergarten entrance dates, they're doing that for a good reason, right? Because they've gotten lots of feedback from teachers, principals, superintendents, uh, that if you let kids in too early who aren't ready for it, it causes lots of problems. I can't argue that. However, those rigid dates also keep out students who are younger who are ready for kindergarten, right? It works both ways. Policymakers generally don't think about that. So uh, this is a pretty obvious example, but when we really ratcheted up high school expectations about eight to 10 years ago, most states, it was a huge conversation. We need to make it more rigorous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of states started really tying financial aid for college into high school graduation, right? Of course, it makes perfect sense. Except for students who are ready to graduate high school early, who couldn't get the required number of credits in two or three years. So a country that traditionally has been very lenient and encouraging about getting students to enter college early. Martin Luther King Jr. was 16 when he went to college. That was not considered strange at all. He was ready to move on, he moved on. Uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, we started to roll those policies back, and we've created these disincentives. So a student could literally leave high school early, get into an Ivy League school, and not qualify for state financial aid for college because they didn't meet the graduation requirements. Those sorts of unintended consequences um, are common in policies. In fact, in public policy, there's only one law and that law is the law of unintended consequences. There is always a downside to every policy, which is why you have to evaluate them carefully. So, that's why. And also, we wanted to put policymaker-friendly data in the hands of advocates, people like yourselves, things that you could bring to your state senator, the House Education Chair, the governor's staff, and say, here's where we are. Some of these are low-hanging fruit. Let's make some positive change and help these kids. So what we did, we worked with an expert advisory board. Uh, we came up with 100 indicators, maybe, <laughs> data points that they thought that we should use. Um, that's way too many. Uh, policymakers are not going to read 100 of them. Uh, and so we started to, win a, to uh, categorize them, and we came up with three different types of, of, of indicators that we used for the report. Um, inputs, which are mostly policies. Participation and then outcomes. How well are each state's students doing? Um, and then we created this really fancy logic model that you don't need to look at because we realized we couldn't get access to almost all of those data. We created a simpler one, which actually works fairly well. Uh, and it's in the report that you have, so I'm not, I'm not going to read through that. But, um, but here's, here's the big problem. Uh, we really thought, and so did the advisory board, that participation was a really important indicator if we're evaluating states. So great, you have all these policies, but if no one actually uses them, then, why, then the policy really isn't effective. And that could really explain why you're not getting great outcomes. Uh, however, we couldn't get participation data on a single input indicator. So for example, the percentage of students taking eighth grade algebra. The most recent data we could find is 2004. And uh, we were calling states, do you have this? And the answer generally was no. 
The answer generally was no. So a lot of the data that we really wanted simply wasn't available. So uh, what's a game show? Family Feud? <laughs> that's not, uh, that was a Richard Dawson Family Feud because that's the only good Family Feud as far as I'm concerned. So. You just had no idea you were going to get a Richard Dawson joke this morning when you were eating breakfast, did you? Keeping you on your toes. Uh, we gathered data mostly from existing sources. Uh, National Association for um, uh, Gifted Children has some great state-level state data they collect every two years. Um, Education Commission of uh, the states, uh, AP, the College Board, helped us. Um, we put everything together when we could. Uh, whenever possible, we tried to be redundant. It was so hard to find some of these data points that a lot of this was not redundant, however. Uh, we did have to call a bunch of states just to make sure that the data that they had in these data sets was accurate. Um, and I, at least 95% of uh, the time, the, the data was confirmed. Uh, we probably did that with uh, 10, 10 different states. Uh, we did have to contact state, state education agencies um, and, uh, and ask them to help us fill in some missing data. Um, they were surprisingly helpful and uh, responsive. Um, so in the end, out of the 459 input policy pieces, uh, there's only two cells in that whole thing where we couldn't get a good answer. Uh, we have answers, but we're just not convinced that they're right. So we have two pieces of missing data out of 459, which is a missing data rate of awesomeness. <laughs> um, what we found. And I'm not, uh, we decided I'm not going to go through every state's grades. Um, you have that all in your packet. Um, uh, no state is hitting, out, hitting it out of the park regarding inputs or outcomes. Uh, the best grades we had were generally Bs in both. Uh, this is not terribly surprising. Um, uh, I mean, how many of you would have said, my state's really crushing this, uh, right? It's just, not, it's just not something that we all believe. And you know what? The data says that you're right. They're not. Most states were Bs, Cs, and Ds. We were very reticent to give any state an F for obvious reasons. But there are states that when we went back and we looked at it and we were like, is there any way we can not give them an F? If your state literally is doing nothing, and we would call those states and say, do you really not have any of these policies? And the answer was yes, every single time. Um, so I think there's three or four Fs on inputs. Um, we did that reluctantly, because uh, they literally are not doing any of these policies that we've identified. Um, so we really tried to be as fair as we could. Some states do much more than others with policy, but the vast majority of states, not surprisingly, out of the nine different policies that we ended up looking at, uh, they do four to six, roughly. Um, Several states do very well with the overall outcomes, like those state maps that I showed. In general, on most of the subtests that we looked at, you will see that there, there are a lot of states that are really getting many students into that advanced category. However, when we broke it out by excellence gaps, most states are largely doing that. If they, if they are achieving success, they are mostly doing it, unfortunately, by um, getting higher income, white and Asian students scoring better. The other groups really are being left behind. So the excellence gaps are widening in most states. They're not shrinking. Um, and it, we thought this was interesting. We pulled uh, three or four states for sort of mini case studies. And we've been calling people in those states saying, you know, here's, here's what we saw. Do you, do you think it's valid? The general response is, yeah, that's, you know, fair. Um, and asking them why they've had success or a lack of success. And, and the, the one thing that keeps coming up, and this is very preliminary at this point, is in any state that got a B on inputs, there was almost always a very strong advocate for talented students and talented low-income students who worked for the State Department of Education. Like they would, everyone would name that person. When so-and-so got here, this turned around. When so-and-so got here, someone in uh, Minnesota told us, this is when the game changed for us. All of a sudden, we were worried about gifted education in inner city Minneapolis and St. Paul. That didn't happen before she got here and really pushed things for us. 
a lot of credit was given. And it seems to be states that also have lots of academics who are also studying these issues. The combination of those resources seems to lead to more pro-excellence state policies. So I thought I'd give you a few highlights, just to things that, patterns that we've started to notice. Um, so you'll see lots of pie charts in that, uh, in, in the, uh, um, excuse me, in the draft that you have. Um, so this is an example of one we thought was kind of low-hanging fruit. The expert advisory panel said, okay, yeah, state X is known for having certain policies, but then they never actually audit to see if the money they give you for this is being used to help students. There's no auditing, they don't actually report on how well the students are doing. And so we thought, okay, if they do any of those things, audit, monitor, report, we'll give them full points on this. Um, but only roughly half of the states do, interestingly enough. And we do count DC as its own state, so. Um, I we thought that was interesting. Uh, most of them have a traditional stoplight pattern. Is it green is good, yellow, eh, uh, pink and red, not so good? Um, we did not, I, I, a lot of states, uh, both in these online data sets and when we talk to them, say, well, you know, the state has no policy, but we don't tell local districts that they can't do it. So we, live it up, we leave it up to the local district. Um, we gave partial points for that because it is theoretically possible that students are still getting services, but how often does that really happen? Uh, generally, uh, if you push it down to that level, uh, services tend to evaporate. Um, so we, we considered that yellow as opposed to green. And then this is one that was really difficult, which kind of talks to the difficulty of this task that we gave ourselves. So we, we gave people full points if they required that teachers and administrators have any training, any exposure to material in general about high ability students defined as broadly as each state wanted to. Uh, and the fact is, only four do. And uh, this is where we have two of those missing data points. And it is we called the states and said, we thought your state did, but in all these surveys you keep saying no. And they gave us such a convoluted answer, we're not really sure if they were telling us yes or no in the end. Well, maybe in an ed psych class they'll get an hour on this is a constant refrain that we heard, but it's not actually required. So our future colleagues are coming through our various prep programs, and they're just not getting exposed to anything about low-income, high-ability students. And then we're shocked when we go and talk to teachers, and we find out that they have all these stereotypes. Well, if they've never, ever heard anything but the stereotypes, why would we expect them to be different? And we certainly wouldn't expect them to be able to effectively differentiate for those students, right? They've literally never had any material on working with those students. Um, so again, we thought that was low-hanging fruit, and it turned out to be the exact opposite. Uh, for output, um, this is a pattern you'll see with every single test. So this is the percentage, uh, this is the number of states that have certain percentages of students scoring advanced. So 16 states had 10% or more of their students scoring advanced in grade eight math. Awesome. Uh, 12 states, eight to 9%, eh, okay. Uh, six to 7%, uh, 14, and then nine, three to 5%. Uh, on this one, fortunately, there were none less than three, which is good, that wasn't true for all of them. But when we look at excellence gaps, you'll notice there's a lot more red and yellow and a lot less green. And for excellence gaps, we really tried to be lenient. So um, you didn't have to have no excellence gap. To get um, bright, bright uh, green, your lower performing group only had to score uh, at about 40% of what the higher performing group was. So we gave full points of states didn't even have uh, a 50% excellence gap, essentially. I didn't explain that very well. But um, it, uh, and even with that low bar, the excellence gaps are so big in most states that it was very hard for us to give very good grades there. Um, and quite frankly, as we uh, talked about, if you, we have a, couple st a few states that have like 17, 18% of their non-low income students scoring advanced. That is fantastic. That is almost a world-class level. That is very impressive. 
but half of the students in those states are low income students by definition, and that percentage is 3% or less. 18 versus three, it was just really hard for us to say, you're really tackling that excellence gap. In fact, it's gigantic. It's a lot of lost talent. So some casual observations. Um, if we had used different indicators, uh, the grades would have been different, certainly. Although, as time has gone on, I haven't said this to Jennifer yet, but the more that I've been thinking about it, um, I don't think it would be different. Uh, uh, if we use different indicators, uh, that definitely means that, that would imply, at least, that there are great pro-excellence policies for low-income students out there that no one really knows about and no one's keeping data on. That just strikes me as probably not all that accurate. Um, uh, some of the missing indicators, things we just couldn't find data on, like percentage of students in eighth grade algebra. Uh, one that we really wanted to use, actually, is U, the number of state-supported selective schools. We think that's a very important indicator of an emphasis that a state places on high achieving students. Uh, and then we were gonna look at the number of low income students who are enrolled in your uh, schools. The problem was we couldn't figure out how to count schools in a reliable way. And saying state support, in some states uh, you're largely self-supporting, in other states you're very well supported. It just became an apples and oranges comparison, so we had to drop it for this round. Again, we were easy graders. Um, uh, first time through, the grades weren't really optimistic, so we went back and said, maybe we're looking at this the wrong way. Uh, and we tried to curve it a little bit, and we still ended up with, ro with, with, with roughly the same thing. Uh, one thing that we really want your feedback on as you kind of skim this uh, is we really wanted to make this about state policy. In no place in this report do we say, teachers are doing a bad job. This is the fault of the low-income students. In no way do we want to imply that uh, we think uh, this is really aimed at state policymakers so that you can bring this to those people when you do meet with them to say, we need to do more for these students. We need to help teachers, we need to help parents, we need to help students. Um, and again, we don't think that policymakers realize that a lot of these policies, like not, like for example, one indicator is uh, allowing middle school students to take high school courses. Uh, if they can't get credit for it, though, are we really helping them move through the system and develop their talents? We would argue no. Um, I, I think most policymakers, most superintendents wouldn't realize that saying you can't earn credit for high school courses you take in middle school is kind of an anti-excellence policy. Um, uh, so we, we just don't think policymakers realize that with some small changes, they can really get a lot of these policies in place. This is a long-term project. Um, the uh, foundation would like to do this uh, on at least a regular basis. Uh, some of the things that we've been talking about a lot the past few days are, 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 are we presenting the data in a, w in, in a way that will really catch the attention of policymakers? That's why there's grades, to be perfectly honest about it. We've played with different ways to do it. Uh, we're constantly talking about new indicators, but to get the best data, we probably need to survey states directly. Um, and not rely on these other data points, because that's probably the only way that we're going to be able to fill it in. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, what we tried to do. I know these last few slides have been very text heavy, so I tried to find a graphic last night that would kind of sum up things, get you pumped up and moving forward constructively, and so uh, that's the best one I could find. <laughs> America, woo, we can do this. We put people on the moon with 1960s technology. We can shrink excellence gaps. We really, really can. Um, okay, uh, questions, comments? Results that you see in your report uh, and how those states may perform on international tests. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, good. Um, uh, I think uh, 11 states participate in various international assessments. Uh, is Maine one of them? I can't remember. I don't, don't, I don't, I don't think you have recently. Um, uh, and, uh, one reason that we like to use the TIMS test for international comparisons, it's designed with the same content framework as NAEP. So it maps directly. So yes, you will find a high degree of correlation there. And, qu and quite frankly, um, so for example, Massachusetts does very well on most international assessments. I can't remember the last time they didn't score top five, top 10 in the world. Very impressive. 
and when you look at advanced scores, it generally holds and their excellence gaps are still very big on most of the international and national and, and, uh, and state tests. So a very good question. Yes, they do correlate pretty closely. Hey, yes, sir. Uh, hi, Todd Roberts, the North Carolina School of Science and Math. Um, so your data point makes a, a great case uh, for why we need to do a better job of nurturing talent in low wealth and underrepresented minority students, and that's a very compelling, clear case. One of the things that, that I think, and maybe you know of some research out there that, that we sometimes struggle with is looking at those sort of same levels of data that support things that really work to do this. Um, for example, like schools like ours, there's not a great deal of research out there that would say, okay, going to a school like yours for these students makes a bigger difference than if it, they went to another school, uh, the same student, apple to apple comparison. So is right. there research out there that, that points to what are some of the, the things that we can do or that are happening that really make a difference in helping these students uh, be successful um, and nurture their talent? Um, yes, and that's really the purpose of the next session is to really get into that in a very detailed way. So I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but it's obviously the question on everyone's mind. Um, I, we, we, do, we do think that there is sufficient uh, at least theory, if not theory, and research to back up the nine policies that we picked for at least setting the stage for helping to turn this around. Um, there's no question there's a lot of other things that we can do. Um, I can, off the top of my head, probably think of a dozen additional state-level st state things. Um, but yeah, when we, when we break into groups here in a little bit, we're, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Thank you. Uh, and my question comes, and you mentioned also earlier sort of the limitations in the test that, ex the, the limitations that inherently exist in the test. Right. So how do we address that? Because we know that poverty impacts a kid's ability to do well on a standardized test. And if we're saying that we're losing talent, but we're not finding that talent because the talent's being measured based on a standardized test that the kids <laughs> set up not point. to do well on, I also get that it's really hard to come up with a standardized test for curiosity or to, to find a way to bring in some portfolio or something. So how do you think we can start to collect data around that or to start look for that for other measures in, in that respect? Um, uh, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna interpret that as a two-part question. Um, the first part is the testing issue. Um, uh, I, I believed that for a long time. I've read some things just in the last week that make me actually question this, in that if we use portfolios, if we use nonverbal assessments we thought were the silver bullet, um, any sort of alternative assessment, we still get these huge income gaps. Um, so I, I'm starting to think, I mean, uh, test taking ability is a real thing. Uh, is it the crux of the problem here? I don't think so anymore. Uh, it's part of the problem, uh, but it's, n it's not really the crux of the problem. Um, the problem, which is what people were talking about yesterday, was just preparation. And uh, uh, I mean, we, we have study after study after study now. You know, every baby that's born in this country has the same intellectual capacity, same capacity to speak infinite number of languages, the same numeracy capacity, the same problem-solving capacity. Literally hundreds of studies have showed this now. Uh, by the time they get to preschool, there are massive SC, uh, socioeconomic status differences and racial differences. Uh, it's not biology, we know this. And yet a lot of our policy still kind of assumes it is. And um, so it, uh, I think early intervention and focusing early really is important. And that's why when we worked with the um, expert advisory panel, we really tried to find indicators that were P through 12. Because um, you know, I, you know uh, a student who's gonna struggle in high school didn't start struggling the day that they showed up at your school, right? And yet, that's how we address a lot of these problems, right? High school needs to solve their dropout problem. Dropout problem doesn't start in ninth grade. It starts in preschool. Um, and uh, the problem is, uh, if you think K-12 indicators are sparse on the ground and of poor quality, preschool indicators are just very hard to find. Um, but I, I, I personally think, this is just me talking, uh, it really is early childhood education. Um, Part of the problem of early childhood education, this is the psychology of policy, which I'm a psychologist by training, cognitive scientist, so this fascinates me. 
is that there have been so many studies that show a huge benefit to preschool education that it's actually almost overkill at this point. So I've heard policymakers go, oh, another study that tells us that early childhood education is going to help these kids do better and have less incarceration and greater income and it's going to save the state money. They've actually stopped believing them because all the studies keep coming back and saying, so it's this weird psychology of, oh, it must all be biased. Um, and that's not limited to education. Um, despite the weather today, the world is getting a lot hotter. Um, uh, but policymakers look at it and go, ugh, another study that says the world is getting warmer. It must be wrong. That's what we're facing with early childhood education, I think. Another study that shows that these things really work. You know what, they, these things must be wrong. Um, I've, I've heard policymakers say that. And um, hopefully, as we get more of these programs in place, we'll get away from that a little bit. But um, there's no question that earlier we start, the better. Because these gaps are pretty well defined by the time they get to kindergarten. Uh, I, this young lady first, and then. I love the young part. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, to follow up on Chancellor Robert's question about research that shows how we can make a difference quickly, I'd like to ask that question of, uh, you indicated the unintended co consequences of policy making and uh, sometimes the over representation of the value of one thing that makes it almost unreasonable in yep. their minds. How do we or is there research that shows how to collaborate with legislators to bring them that understanding of uh, the gap, the high ability, um, low income, um, and how do we, knowing it's all local, how do we do that at the state level um, in partnership with them, especially since they have so many other major cool. issues to deal right. with? Yeah, it, um, I, I, uh, I know that the three breakout groups are going to be talking about this, um, so I'll just briefly address it here. Um, it, uh, you know, I think part of the problem with advocating for these students in uh, the past is that we, we generally have used the these kids have special needs approach, which I don't disagree with in any way, shape, or form. They absolutely do. But it's not a great advocacy argument in my experience because you go in and you say, look, these kids have special needs. But then you leave the room and then the State Association for Parents with Autistic Children come in the room and they say, our kids really have special needs. They have already forgotten that you walked out of their office 15 minutes earlier. I mean, it's so hard to make that our kids are special -er, -er, er than yours are argument. And they're all special, right? They're our kids. Um, uh, that's why we kind of came up with the excellence gap to turn it into an equity and excellence argument. If you don't want to argue excellence, fine. There's still a huge equity argument to be made here. This is systematically unfair. And given that these students who are not performing at advanced levels are over half of our student population, and they're the fastest growing segments of it, um, getting, z you know, on most of these tests, those students, one or two percent are scoring advanced. We cannot keep this country running with one or two percent of our students scoring advanced. That is impossible. Um, I always hated the economic argument, uh, especially as a parent. My kid's not a widget. Don't make the economic argument about them. Policymakers love economic arguments, though. Um, and so that's one that we use. If I, have, if I had to pick one thing, one policy to put in place that I think would make a huge difference, it's to have meaningful indicators in your state accountability system that reward excellence. I actually, sorry. I actually, uh, I know it's easy to teach your bash. Um, I do think, in general, having traveled the world, the United States has a very good educator workforce. Well-educated, stable. Could we do better? Of course. Um, uh, are we training teachers and principals and superintendents as well as we probably could? They all tell me no, so I'll trust them. Um, but in general, they're really good at figuring out how to help certain groups of kids. If we put rewards in place for specific groups of students, I personally would be very happy stepping back and watching and see what happens. I'm willing to bet that people step up to the plate. But 
I could be wrong. Jose, Jose yes, Torres, uh, IMSA. Um, you said that uh, in this report you were easy grader. Uh, it was an easy, uh, giving easy grades. And I wonder if it was a bizarro world where the uh, achievement gap was upside down, where African American and Latino students were way up and white and Asian students were way down. How, how easy a, a grade, would, and how would this report be different? Wow. That is a high level philosophy question. Um, I can't imagine it would be much different. There would be still huge gaps. Someone interesting, um, uh, gosh, who was it? on Twitter the other day, a well-respected DC ed policy person uh, on the right side of the spectrum asked, would all you liberals be upset if, if we still had huge income inequality, but with that inequality, we had very few people in poverty? Uh, and it was a great question to fight about. Uh, and in the end, no one really could answer it. Um, but in the end, it was so abstract and so not going to happen. Uh, I don't know if it really matters. But I don't know. It's a very good question. Other questions? I have exactly three minutes and one second to answer additional questions. Jonathan? I'm not being timed or anything. Jonathan? Um, as Jane, we're, yeah. yeah, as we're wrapping up, I just I thought because, I, I kn of course, you're ta stealing so much thunder, but. Um, the room probably should learn a little more about what's on your website because you have, you talked about NAEP data today, but the state assessment data would of course be really oh. valuable for everyone in the room to know about. Yeah, yeah, there's two websites you should know about, one of which is ready and one of which isn't. So um, on the m second one from the bottom, the Mind the Gap website, we have both of our reports, but we also have uh, PDFs for every state looking at state's NAEP data and, this, and each state's own test data, AP scores. So you have all these data in one very concise place that we've designed with policymakers and with them in mind. Um, so definitely, uh, definitely go and you can download all of that. Uh, the uh, foundation is preparing an Excellence Gap website that will host this report and lots of other very cool, um, helpful things and that's a few weeks away. Thank you, Jane.